Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the episode 67 of the Intramuros Learning Sessions. Um, I'm your host, uh, Jeffrey Yap uh, from the Intramuros Administration. So uh, Rancho Arcelia is currently on a health break. <laughs> so um, for the meantime, I will be the one hosting, uh, will be hosting uh, this afternoon's uh, learning session. Okay, so um, this afternoon session is very interesting because we will be um, discussing about the civil society and local collaboration with uh, Chiang Mai as a creative city. But um, before that, let me share my screen for some house rules. All right. So for our Zoom attendees, um, I see a number of um, tour guides this afternoon. So welcome to ILS. Uh, you may raise your questions via the Q&A button that you will see on the screen, on the lower part of your screen. Um, for the viewers on Facebook Live, you may also raise your question uh, in the comment section. So please feel free to type in your comments. And only those who have successfully registered and viewed on Zoom uh, will be able to get an e-certificate, which will be emailed to you after the um, after a week, actually, uh, once you have filled out the feedback form, which will also be emailed uh, um, after the session. So please allow at least one week for your e-certificates to be sent. Uh, okay, and then the number four is please note that this webinar is recorded and the recording will be permanently available in IAS Social uh, I social media channels. Okay, so intro uh, to introduce the speaker. Our speaker this afternoon is uh, Ari, Ari Japa Pradit. She's the assistant lecturer of architecture in uh, Rahamangla Gala University of Technology. Um, Ari, uh, Ari Rapa is an independent researcher and assistant lecturer of architecture at the Rahamangala University of Technology. And she's also an experienced urban planner, uh, urban design, and um, also has an experience in cultural heritage and public participation, as well as engagement processes. She has a Bachelor of Architecture from the Rahamangala University of Technology as a as well as a master's degree of science in urban and rural design from the Queen's University, Belfast, United Kingdom. Okay, so without further ado, let me introduce our speaker. The floor is yours. Sorry, I... Hi, hi everyone. So I'm very honored to be here and to um, present my ongoing work and actually uh, I would love to like discuss to everyone and I would love to just like uh, everyone to participate with the question and any question you you want to ask me just feel free to do so I hope that uh, this presentation will be relaxed and will um, help a lot of people understanding a lot more about how civil society work or how it's um, impact the the city and even like um, cultural heritage conservation. So very nice to meet you all. So um, can we just, okay. This is our first slide. I hope everyone see and maybe for like those of you who probably don't know where is Chiang Mai. Um, Chiang Mai is actually like a, a city in the North. So it was found in, um, Sorry, let me follow my slide. Okay, it was found in 1296. So um, it's actually situated in like, like a valley. So basically our city sit in the foot of the, the big mountain. If you look carefully at the history itself, how the city is established, it came from like three kings. Uh, they collaborate together and then they just want to build a new city because Chiang Mai is actually a new city of the north. That's the, the meaning of the name. 
And Chiang Mai itself has been like, a, like the city of the north in the past hundred years. If you follow the history of, of the country development, um, the reason I, I talk about the geographical condition of Chiang Mai is that you will see that it's the combination of culture and nature at the same time. And you can see from the picture below that, even though the city is growing, but we all protect our mountain. And that's related to the core value that I want to discuss later, why people here really fight for environment, really fight for the, the, the cultural heritage. Uh, next slide, please. If you look at the geographical condition, you can see like um, the city of Chiang Mai, basically we call it the rectangle city or the wall city, just right at the foot of, of Doi Sutep or, or uh, Sutep Mountain. Uh, the city was found 725 years ago and it was, it was such a very like strategic place back then of the north. Uh, and Chiang Mai itself become part of Siam or Thailand uh, in about not, not really, not over 120 years ago. Um, I, I'll, I'll show you like the exact number. Okay, later on is fine. Um, you, can, you can see like the, the map on the right. Um, the city itself, there's so many historical places and the historical places in, is not just the artifact itself, but what people believe. And these kind of thing also related to the kinship or like the relationship between people within the family. So you can see that the, the natural of people from Chiang Mai, they believe in nature, they protect like their, their own um, spirit and ancestor spirit that what we call. But why is really important because um, we were independent for many years, for about um, 500, 500 years before we became part of Siam. And that creates such a strong sense of citizenship of Chiang Mai people. And that is the, a very solid foundation of uh, everyone who, who, come, who, who live in Chiang Mai, that they have a very high sense of citizenship, that they want to protect the city or like do the best for their own city. Next slide, please. Um, this is the picture of nowadays. Picture on the left show you is that if you look carefully at the, the urban fabric or like the ornament that, that exists on, on, uh, within the city, you see a high rise building, you see like many buildings and then you see temple and you see a lot of tree. So a lot of people who come to Chiang Mai found it very fascinating because every corner and every place they go, there is always a story or like uniqueness. And this kind of urban fabric has been here for since the, the, the establishment of the city. You can see the, the map on the right, that's uh, demonstrate. It's actually the first map by James McCarty. He's Irish, uh, English Irish. He drew a map of Chiang Mai and you can see that there is a, like a big rectangle town and then there's like a, like a curve outside. Um, so what I explain here is that there are hierarchy or um, because Chiang Mai is really diverse, there's so many ethnic groups and every ethnic group they have their own like culture and tradition. And there are also hierarchy or just like, oh, who should stay where and the reason why. Because everything, every, every culture and lifestyle and tradition always like attached with the urban planning. And that creates such a uniqueness of, of Chiang Mai and Chiang Mai people. Next slide, please. So this basically show the nowadays picture, what's really going on in the city. If you come to the city of Chiang Mai, especially the wall city or the old city, you see the combination of big tree that has been there for like hundred years. You will see like a very unique Lana architecture. You see like old people dancing during ceremony. You will see like people got together to do some uh, cultural practices and you will see like student and monk walking around Chiang Mai. And that show the core value of Lanna culture, which uh, include the, the culture itself, architecture, environment, and unique tradition. Next slide, please. Um, but since Chiang Mai become a strategic 
location for development start um, around 1987. We call National Economic um, Plan uh, number six. Uh, the, the central government proposed Chiang Mai as strategic place of the North and that attract a lot of mega development to the city. You can, you can see the picture, the chain. Picture on the left was taken around like 100 years ago. You see like a lot of people still living their own life. The architecture was really like modest, really small houses, a lot of markets, people still live in their own way. And then after that picture on the right, it, it started when Chiang Mai become a strategic place that the government want to put many investment into it. We start having like a, a lot of architecture, a lot of uh, construction, a lot of modern architecture. Like uh, the picture you see on the right, basically the high rise building of the hotel building that happened about 40, 40 years ago. And that changed the urban fabric. But what really impact to the people? You have to understand that Chiang Mai people or Lana people, we had our own strong culture for a very long time. And when we become part of Siam, when we, we become a strategic place for development, everything happens so quick and people far, far, far is really hard to adjust. But back then at the same time, we didn't really have a proper planning regulation or we don't really have uh, conservation planning, anything that, that can protect our heritage. And that somehow uh, create like a big crash between local people and central government. Um, next slide, please. You can see um, one of the thing that really changed the city, we, uh, we call comprehensive plan. Comprehensive plan is basically a color planning of the city that aside from the central government to many city, many big city around, around Thailand. So we had our comprehensive plan back in 1984. And you can see that the area was still small. Um, and then the comprehensive plan, they revised every five years and the area that covered the city get bigger and bigger. And between the comprehensive plan uh, that started in 1999 until 2012, there were so many movement and big crash between local people, academics with the central government. And that um, lead to like the many movement by civil society or activists in the city. And that's why like these people are really important to the city as well, because um, they just stand together and say, oh, we don't have to obey everything that the central government want us to do. We want to protect our city. We want to protect our value. Why don't we just got together and like fight for it? So you can see on the next slide, next slide please, that when Chiang Mai become a rapid, rapid growth city, it become like a learning city, it become like amazing Thailand, Thailand like tourist attraction, it's become creative city. They definitely want to propose Chiang Mai as a world heritage site. Uh, Chiang Mai will become like a my city, like a big conference city. Everything came at the same time and it was too much. And that's create like a big gap between local people and some central government. And also create like the movement and the idea is that how can I protect my city? How can I protect my heritage? And who are you to like come from nowhere or you don't even know the area and want to develop our land? Next slide, please. Um, these are just examples of the movement that happened um, around 1987 from, from, from that period. Um, actually, there's so many factors. Part of it, it was because of the, the political turmoil that happened in 1973 until 1976 in, in central Bangkok. The political turmoil between young generation, especially like student university and military um, government create like a big crash between young generation and old generation. And those young generation, they move out from the city. They move out to many remote area and also Chiang Mai was one of the strategic place for, for a young student to, to stay. And um, this movement happened because students also don't believe 
in the in the old idea of democracy at all. They don't believe that the central government have the right to control their own land. And that's become like, um, become the reason why Chiang Mai, a big city at the north, uh, is very individual in terms of just like, they have their own idea, they have their own right. They, they're not scared to walk on the street and ask for their own right. The picture on the, on, on the slide, was ha happened in around 1986 or 1987 when the central government want to build like a cable car up to Doi Tape. And then people said, oh, this is not right. Doi Tape, it's just like my heart and my head. So you cannot put anything on my head and we don't want that to happen. And that's the time when young students who escaped from the political turmoil, academics and local people, even students got together and protest for it. And you know, this kind of movement still happen today, but you will see on the next, on, on the upcoming slide, the difference between the old fashion of the movement and the new fashion of the movement. But also at the same time, this kind of movement really, really protect the value of Chiang Mai. They, whatever they want to do, whoever they are, they just want to protect the city. And they believe in the, the, the good system of democracy. They want to show the central government that they have their own right to, uh, to to protect their land. Next slide, please. Okay, you will see from here that this is the combination of the, the old fashion and the new fashion of civil society. Uh, because people in Chiang Mai, they're really individual, even myself, we're quite independent in our thought and in our mind. So you see that there's so many people who who are like activists who are like ready to help the city. But what makes it different is that the old fashion of movement always just like try to create like political unrest directly between people and the government. But the new civil society or activists, they're more compromised. As you can see on the right that I, that I put on the bullet point. First of all, uh, like I said before, people of Chiang Mai, they have such a very unique character that they're highly protective of their own city and their culture. They have very high sense of citizenship. And many movements in the past that you see from the picture above did make a lot of change, especially in terms of law and regulation. And also like the movement that happened since 1986 until now is always, always related to the, the share value we have and the share interest. And even also like nowadays, even for COVID, it's turned out that there's so many activists that turn themselves from like political movement or environmental movement to help, um, to help fighting for COVID for people of Chiang Mai. Next slide, please. Um, what you can see here is that uh, there were so many sessions that, polit uh, that civil society got together and, and have a meeting. And myself also have interviewed many of like NGO or many of activists. We were discussing like why there's so many failure from central government and why we people who come from here have to do extra work, right? Because we believe that anything that the central government want to develop, they supposed to act local not just like outside work or outside mega development to the city. And these are basically just the, the, key, the key summary that first, because of state operational structure is really, really, um, really stiff that make it easy to understand. It's really difficult for them to change or change the structure or move or adapt themselves to the real world scenario. And also the government will process are really ups often determined by rule and power and imposing limitation on the way they can operate. You know, whatever it's easy for them, they'll do it. Whatever they have done before and success, they'll do it everywhere in the country. And also government agency will, the process of working with people just like only ask for their opinion, but they never really create any collaborative work at the planning state at all. Even though the constitution did not, uh, the, the constitution say that the government people have to work with local people, but well, they say that we work, but we just offered their opinion, not really plan with them at the first date. 
and also the way that the the state budget was designed um, is really hard to to implement on the site sometime. And also there's so many rules and they scare up audit regulation. So that's why it make the work process less creative. And these are like like kind of like the key, the key, the key factor why central government are more, uh, they are more or less creative than, than local people. Next slide, please. Um, so I just I just need to to explain that whatever I have been talking about is actually a research project that me and my team are working on it now. So we just want to like understand more as, pe as people from Chiang Mai and we want to understand more about the structure and why people create such a movement to protect their own city. Well, actually it is government job to protect the land for people, right? So I did a lot of interview from like very, very um, high level, high level people, or we call like the original NGO to like the new generation of activists. Uh, I interview a lot of these people and also like work, um, do a lot of analysis about a 40 group of, of people who work in the city. And the next slide will show like um, the, the period of, of uh, civil society of Chiang Mai. Next slide, please. Um, Okay, this is the structure that I see from 1973 up to 1997. You see that back then, uh, because of there was a big political turmoil between young generation and military government. So the young generation, they don't believe in the government system at all. So they move out from the central Bangkok and like stay in many remote area. And once the political turmoil get better, it was the time that Thailand was still under developed country. So back then the country had received a lot of external fund or international funding from many international organization. And these young people who don't believe in democracy in, in the, sorry, in military government, work together with these international organizations to get funding. And then they bring the new idea to local people and sometimes working with academics. They usually focus on area-based and issue-based, but mostly about environmental things in remote area. And whatever that they can, they can do against the government, they would do. Uh, one of the most important cases is that the government themselves just let uh, investor uh, on a very precious land of community. So what they did is that the NGO or the young generation who get funding from, uh, from international organization, they work with community people and they strike, they make a lot of movement just to make um, negative impact out to the media. And they use the, this, these movement and media to give pressure to government but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Government have the like 100% of their like power in their hand. Sometimes it's turned out, it's turned out that government use the law, the law, the law and enforcement to like, to control the situation. But at the end of the day, after many clashed, they both find solution. And that's like kind of like, I, I, I call it the old fashioned way of like, uh, social movement or civil society that how they work up until 1997. Next slide, please. The reason that it made such a great change in 1997 because of the constitution. We call the constitution in 1997 as people constitution because it was the first time that the government recognized diversity of community people. They said that any of authority, any government body need to work directly with people and give people right to plan together. And that's, we call this constitution as like um, people constitution. And this kind of effect changed the way NGO activists or civil society work because back in 1997, Thailand has become a developing country. 
So there are the decline of international funding, they move away. So a lot of ONGO, they couldn't get any external funding at all. So they have to change the way, they have to adapt the way they work. And usually like they start working with people because they're interested in something, got together as a person and work with community and they combine the knowledge with academic expertise. And instead of just working on the area of two base, they start implementing the public participation process into their work and they don't create any like strike or bad movement at all. They believe in communication. They believe in public communication and they believe in seeking for collaboration more than giving the government pressure. And they found that this, such, this kind of positive impact really, really work with the government. And it's easier for them to cooperate with the government instead of just like do a lot of strike or political unrest they adapt their own way and the constitution had such a big impact to the way they work so this kind of system happened until now next slide please so these are just like the summary of the evolution so i'm, I'm, I'm not i'm not going to go through every detail but the most important period would start from like 1986 afterward that people start to see like the, the differentiation between like giving negative impact or positive impact to the government they they we see the differences like um respond that they get from from the government so that's why it led to like the new era of, of civil society next slide please um, I did mapping, as I said before, like I interview a lot of people and I can see the connection. As you can see here is that what makes it really interesting that the idea of civil society, the idea of um, value of the city, it transmits through people, it transmits through person, and even it's transmit through like working collaboration. These just the relationship or the net networking map that I that I work with 40, 40 group of people who call themselves a civil society. And you can see like the, the solid color, uh, the box with col solid color, basically they register group and the white color, they're like independent group and body. You can see like these people are actually connected somehow. So, and this kind of network actually drive the city for nowadays. The reason is that because Chiang Mai has a very long history of like we call like fighting fighting for people right so it long enough and then central government aware that okay any project that come to Chiang Mai everyone uh, everyone have to be careful you have to work with people of Chiang Mai and I think that creates such a very solid foundation to protect the city in any spec in any aspect it could be like uh, future development it could it could be heritage conservation. It could be anything, tourism. It could be just like environmental issue. It could be anything because we have such a solid foundation that we know exactly what we want for the city and we want the best for the city. Next slide, please. Um, one of the examples is that you can see the differences of color of the comprehensive plan. I have to give you the background. Comprehensive plan, came from central government. So they have 100% authority to control the, the growth and the use of the land. The comprehensive plan in 1999, you can see that they protect the old city, but they allow the area, the area around the old city to build a high rise building and people say, people say that this is not cool, this is not good at all. So there was a lot of movement from like local people, academics, and like even students in the city said that we disagree with this comprehensive plan at all. We don't like it. And we want to protect our old city as the original map you see from previous slide. And also you see the color on the top, on the right, that's the area that's next to the river it was red before, and now it's turned into yellow cross white because this was a historical historical area for like um, 
um, the British, uh, British um, take business that happened more than 50 years ago. And there were so many um, significant architecture. There's so many beautiful architecture and people want to protect it because uh, the point is that the comprehensive plan is authority or a planning come from central government. And if they don't understand the area, it could make change or it could destroy the historical value of the city. And as you can see that it's not just, the comp it's not just people win that they can change the color from the, from the central government. There are, we also create like, we call, we call municipal ordinance. So basically the regulation to control the height of the building within the old city. We also like uh, revise the area of where we want to preserve as the historical city. We also succeed to in delaying uh, a lot of many planning permission process. So these are just some example of the work that people really fight for it that does come from people like power. Next slide, please. Um, also, one of the thing is that this is to show the structure of heritage conservation of Chiang Mai. You can see that most of them are basically from the central government directly to the local level. But um, the official body or official unit that I that I uh, that has the the red box there basically include local people as the committee or as, uh, as the working team, and that's another success. Uh, that we could make uh, after a long period of time of fighting. We, call, we always call fighting because it's not easy at all to like convince central government or to like make them realize that people power is the most important thing. Myself also part of the working team, working team and committee for like historical city of Chiang Mai as well. So we hope to make change from like the bottom level, but not as just like individual, but as a, an organization as a people or as a group of people that central government recognize. So that's another uh, achievement that we created. Next, please. Oh, and, and yeah, it's fine. It's fine, next next one. Um, so, uh, maybe the photo missing, it's fine. The point is that um, we can see like the new civil society nowadays, they have different idea from the old civil society that's work since 1973. Um, uh, Nowadays, civil society, or we call, we call them activists, they believe in like building good relationship between people and, and authority. They believe that to success something, we need to like uh, uh, have collaborative idea and development plan and following the government authority in a more creative way and expecting to change from local level, we want to make change from bottom up and strengthen local people. That's the most important thing. We believe in sustainable development by implementing SDG from UNESCO framework at local level. Um, although like central government have been talking about SDG, but they never really successfully implement through their own structure because their structure was really old and very stiff, like very, very hard to change. And also, whatever we are working out at the moment, we aim to be resilient in working structure in response to the city called value. Next slide, please. Here is this example of like the work that really happening in the city at the moment. So any project that we want to do develop in the city that related to culture, tradition, people, community, we always work in the in, in, in the way that we want to create to create cross-sector collaboration. You can see in the picture that we work with the government themselves, and then we have round table with, with public, anyone can join the talk. We have site visiting, we walk into everyone's house and ask about their opinion. We have a meeting and we have like everyone opinion on the paper and plan, I even even work with the monks sometimes. And that's just an example that we want to improve one street. So we believe that the old idea of just making movement or strive with the local government wouldn't work anymore. We, we have to find collaboration idea from everyone. Next slide, please. 
And this is also, we believe in all level engagement, engagement as well. You can see that anyone, doesn't matter what is your job, can like come and work with us. And we listen to every opinion. And also like any work that happened in the city should involve young students as well, young students, old people. They also have the right to express their own opinion and they need toward the, the development. Next one, please. Also, this is probably the example that you can see very obvious. If you know Chiang Mai, you probably heard about like, oh, we have a uh, like a lantern festival in November and it's attract a lot of like tourism. It create a lot of money to local uh, tourism industry. But actually this kind of activity on the top left, I believe, left or right, like the one that I do the red cross, was this kind of tradition, like releasing thousand and million lanterns into the sky was really damage, damaging. It created a lot of problem and pollution to the city. And the experts say that it, was, it wasn't actually our local tradition. So local people got together and start fighting for it. Back then, 10 years ago, you would see this kind of like lantern release up into the sky. You would see like a, lot a lot of tourists enjoy it. But nowadays, they're not allowed to do that anymore within the old city. So local people got together and introduced the traditional way to celebrate the full moon festival or the lantern festival. And this kind of process welcome everyone, welcome students to learn how to make the traditional lantern how to do the celebration with like nail dancing. And also uh, we have like a big event in the middle celebrate full moon festival in a good way or in a, a, an authentic Lana tradition way. And local community and civil society have been working on this for 10 years and successfully create a lot of like, um, a, a lot, a lot of, people to enjoy and even if it could generate a lot of money into the city as well. Next please. And also um, nowadays civil society. The reason why I said that civil society is a driven thought because me myself also as a civil society get paid for working for this, you know. This is uh, what you see on the slide is that there was a new planning proposal that they want to build a very big high-rise building on the historical street. And we all just like architect and, you know, people who work in the university or even just local people just like, oh, we cannot let this happen because if this building happen, it's going to destroy the skyline of the city. What can we do? So we just make a call to the local council and say like, oh, we don't want this to happen. And we start the process of negotiation. And this is the new way of working. I mean, not really the new, the new civil society working with government. If this happened back in 1970, people would just like say bad thing about the local, local government or even just like strike with their opinion. But this kind of thing, this kind of like negotiation process create like creativity for local people to work with uh, local council as well. And now we successfully to like delay the application. And we work with the Council of Architects of Chiang Mai to like redesign a little bit. I mean, redesign a lot of things of the building to make it more like modest and make it uh, better for, for the area itself. Next, please. Uh, this is just like the summary, because as I say, like we actually are now working on uh, a lot of analysis about civil society, how they impact to, uh, to the, the urban planning, how they impact to like uh, heritage conservation. Uh, these are just four points that we, we summarize. First thing we see that civil society is no longer act disconnectly from the state at all. They now want to fostering like constructive cooperation where all parties are involved in the process. And also the work of civil society is fundamentally based on cooperation between local people, community, and helping all parties understand the process which drive the city. 
and avoiding uh, structural framework obstacle, such as budget and regulation. Because there's so many times that people want to make change, but the government body just say, oh, we don't really have the budget that fit with this, and our regulation doesn't allow this to happen. But we all have to just like, kind of like work with them and try to propose, well, this is the way, this is the option that you can do without, without overrule all your regulation or without like harming any of your budget process. And we think that creativity, so-called creativity, really happen or arise from collaborative, collaborative work per se, where everyone participate in both design operation, of course. <coughs> and also, sorry, we believe that creativity cannot be achieved by inserting program on behalf of people or community. You cannot just like walk into a community, just like, oh, if you want to be creative, if you want your city to be better, do this. But rather, we have to let them learn the process with us. And then finally, they will create like their own process, become more creative and work with their own people and, and their own community and make change from like a very bottom unit or like make change, make change from like a very small unit. Uh, next slide, please. So um, now we are working on like, three project at the moment, if you can find on, on Facebook. So we have Ching Mai WeCare. It's actually an independent Facebook that promote local, local capacity building and also like promote like many work from like young civil society or young generation that, that, that they want to work with the city. The second one is we have a Facebook called Ching Mai Learning City. So basically we got funding from uh, Research Authority of Thailand to use the UNESCO framework of learning city to implement into the city of Chiang Mai. So this project will be more a lot more about civil society collaboration and working with people how to uh, make place or how to change the development in, in, in the city to become more like people's, people based. And me myself also work for the Chiang Mai Trust like organization so this organization basically been helping a lot of COVID, uh, a lot of uh, people who get affected by COVID. And also we work for food security and food bank as well. Um, the main purposes for this group is that we want to like um, promote the work from like little people or from like many individual that have been such a driving force of the city. And we want to develop a cross sector working group we want to introduce them to each other and then everyone just share the idea and make the city be better. And also we believe that nowadays everyone, mo almost everyone, they use the online platform. So we hope that this online platform will just like promote and enhance collaboration uh, together with other people. Last one, please. So, uh, sorry, this is in Thai, but these are just like, because I, we're still working on the research process, but these are just example that would be one of our production that we would come out with the summary idea, like a guideline if you want to work for the day, for the city, where you should where you should start and who you should contact or how you should st should start. So we we hope that in the future we translate these guideline into English and share like worldwide. So this uh, thank you very much for like for your attention and and uh, thank you very much for everyone here to listen to the presentation. Thank you very much uh, for for that very interesting presentation. Um, in fact, um, I believe we can also apply um, the, the learnings uh, from the presentation uh, to our community in Intramuros as well, and as well as to other cities. Okay, so um, we we have a number of questions um, here. Um, uh, I hope you don't mind if if you uh, to to answer some of the, the questions here. Um, for, for those who would like to ask um, our dear speaker, uh, we have the Q&A button uh, for those uh, who are registered on Zoom. And for those who are on Facebook Live, please feel free to um, type in your questions in the comment section. We will be more than um, happy to, to answer them. Okay, for the first question, um, how do we balance um, the commercial demands of mm -hmm. tourism 
um, mm-hmm. versus the need to protect the authenticity of a place. Yeah. Well, actually, this is very interesting because we we have discussed about it as well because Chiang Mai, I think before COVID, we had like 10 million visitors and that's gen- generate a lot of like income. We see that the key point to answer that question is that the tourism sector need to understand the value as well of, of, of the city, but how? The point is that local people also have to protect it first and show those who work in tourism industry that this is something that you should learn. This is something that you should get like people to understand our culture because uh, you have to, to understand that the many tourism sector, they would try anyway, whatever to make a lot of like interest or to make a lot of money, even if bring like some, some outside tradition or outside way of tourism to, to the city. So I think we have to work both way. Local people or local government have to like say, hey, this is what you should do in the city, what you can do in the city. And this is what you cannot do. While like tourism sector, sector have to understand the character of each area, because I believe that it's not just in the North. I think every part of the, of any country, they have different like character. So it's just both way of working. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's a question in relation to, to that, to, to, to the involvement of, of the community. Um, how does Chiang Mai encourage the youth to, to be involved in, in the cause? Yes. Well, I think that's a very interesting question because Chiang Mai has one of the biggest university of the North. And I think part of it is that those, those students live in the city and they start loving the city regardless of where they come from. And the way we encourage is like, there's so many very first, first, first of all, university itself, they have so many campaign to, to build like a, a young generation activist. That's the first thing. The second thing is that many, many of civil society people, every work, every time they work, they try to like welcome more students or like they try to work directly with young generation because they believe that these young generation will become like a better person or a good civil society or anyone in the future that understand the, the true value of the city. I think the third thing is that I also have to give some credit for local authority because they have changed uh, in the past 10 years, they have changed a lot. So they start implementing or they start promoting the, the value of the culture or the authenticity part, uh, as part of their like working system. And also because we have so many schools and so many university, um, young students start to learn and understand that value at the very young age gradually. And once they become adult or when they go to the university, they start to understand and they start to see like the, like they just see in the city, they see in real life that, oh, there are these people exist and I want to become like that, yeah. Okay. Um, th- there was also a mention of um, student activism or involvement yep. uh, in your presentation. Um, what kind of acti- activism is it and how does it translate into um, to their cause um, in relation to a creative city? Um, you mean like the only young student or just like um, general? Mm. Yeah, in general or perhaps okay. the young students as well. Okay. I think what we believe in creative Creative for us is not just you talking about art and culture. Creative is the ability that you able to use the existing resource to make a new thing or just like to be, to find a a new way of solution. We have to admit one thing that the, the country educational system is quite outdated. It's really outdated and Mm. Thai educational system really did never really encourage students to speak out or to like say everything out. So as a civil society, you can see like the picture of the full moon festival. That's part of the tool that we want, we attract a lot of students to come and allow them to learn traditional and some creative work that they can do. 
So I think that that part of uh, the foundation and also Chiang Mai is like UNESCO creative city in, in, in like craft Manchester. So our curriculum, especially in university, in, in the university also change themselves to become more creative. You know, like um, that, that would be one of, that would be factors. But if we talk in general, I think we have to work a lot on it because student in high school, or even student in primary school day, they learn history, but not history from here. They learn history from central government. And they stop, a lot of them stop speak um, dialect. And, and, that's, and that's also affect the creativity or also limit the way they understand lo the local culture as well. Mm -hmm. um, given that the civil society groups are from different backgrounds, I believe. Yes, um, yes. Yes. Um, do they have one consensus that they need to achieve? Or no, no at not all. Not really. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're really, they're really individual. Mm -hmm. They're really individual. But, and but if you do grouping, mm -hmm. there are four things that they're interested in: environment, culture, urban planning, and we call like creative business. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. Yep. So Why it's not? a good thing that there are various sectors and various causes in order yeah. to address each and every concern. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but the point is that because they mm -hmm. really have a high individual character, mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to get them together and work at the same time. So what what we found is that we have to let them lead their own work, and then other body or us as academic go and support them, or just like um, I think there there's some like gap between group as well. So, I mean, sometimes they're really competitive, but sometimes they're not, you know. Where do they get their funding? Is there like a public funding? <laughs> well, from, from how do they um, start their, their cause or how they um, organize their, their groups? Can you believe that? Most of them, when they started, they didn't really get funding. They start from just like, this is what I, what really, mm. what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> but there, there's like organization like um, the government organization that support uh, community-based work, but it's not that much. So, I mean, I, I would say there are three ways for them to, to get funding. First, they get funding from just like donation. They become like, oh, they want to work on this area. These are people they want to help. Uh, would you be able to like do some donation? That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that, that gets funding from many central government body. As you can see that after 1997, many organizations start offering funding to the civil society people. And the third thing is that there are also civil society that do businesses. You know, they're, they're kind of like, they have two hats. One hat they're like businessmen and one hat they're like working for, for, for like community. So they balance these two things together, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. Um, so there, there's more of a sustainability in that sense or in that regard. Yeah. Yes. Um, how do you choose the sectors to be consulted? Um, mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to say that they all mm, they all working work overlapping. You know. They're not just like, oh, I only work for environment, then I don't work for urban. No, they're all just like urban and, and, and environment. If mm -hmm. we have to choose, we not only choose where they work or what they work for, we shoot their character as well. Okay, what if this problem happened? We will like call this civil society group in because they're such a fighter. And then we call another one in just like, oh, they're like a good planner. I'll call another one in it just like oh this person is really compromised so we have to like look at the situation first because i i work i have many hat here i am academic as well a researcher part of civil society as well and that's how we really work yeah uh, it's hard to like identify completely that we have to go one direction yeah 
Was there ever an instance that there was a tension between civil society and local community? You mean like relationship or what, sorry? Um, perhaps um, in terms of, of the direction um, of, of they want to advocate. Mm. I think mm. most, most of um, civil society, they usually start from the area where they live. And they usually start from like the area where they know local people or they used to live. And, and that's how you build up from that. Uh, I mean, that's why each civil society will have their own area mm -hmm. that they've been working for a really long time. And they would, they would have like certain group of people that they've been working with. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, even if you look at the network or try to like map everything on, on on, on the map, you will see many overlapping layer, which is complex, very complex. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I hope you don't mind. We, we have a number of questions here. I think. Sure, sure, sure. Our, Just keep yes, our, our um, audience are very interested on in how they can apply um, the, the learnings from Chiang Mai to, to Manila or maybe to other cities as well. Um, yes. We have uh, a few questions here from uh, on our chat box. Um, okay. How do you make sure the sustainability of your projects and initiatives, even agreements with local government, if there is a, a sudden, say, a sudden change in government administration or a change of allocations in budget? Does it apply to, to Chiang Mai? Yes, definitely. You see the full moon festival, right? Um, yes. Definitely, as a civil society, there are chains of budget from the government and even the structure of the, the governor of Chiang Mai Chiang every, almost every year. So we have to work on uncertainty, but to achieve that or to achieve sustainability, we have to plan the way we work, not based on the budget, but based on the people and community. So that's why if you look at the structure of working, um, civil society people will have strong um, network and relationship with the area, the people, and the value of the event itself, while the budget can rotate. Okay. If you know what I mean. Yes. Every year they will come with the plan just like, we want to do this, this is how we are gonna work. This is how many people we want to work with. And then create like a small proposal, mm -hmm. like, to, to the government or to the budget. doesn't matter you give me or not. If you don't give me, it's fine. I'll, for, I'll rotate to another like organization. And I think that's part of it because you, we don't decide everything based on the budget. We have, to, we have to be the one who hold the core value that everyone in the city agree that this is the same value. And I think that's the, the, the solely point. And that's the way we create sustainability in working with civil society. Mm -hmm. There's a follow-up question here. Um, was there an instance where in, uh, there was a good initiative that you wanted to push through but uh, was not implemented uh, due to some conflict in government regulation, ordinance, or law? Um, one of the things is that we, we have, this is a big problem, um, <laughs> in, in Chiang Mai, we have like a small canal called Mecca Canal, like canal around the city. It had been a problem for almost 50 years, has been polluted. The problem that it never succeeds because if you want to change this canal, you have to deal with at least five authority. Authority of urban planning, local, uh, local council, authority of like, like that manage all the water, and the government land and community. So this is just a big instant and it's been, it's still been a problem. There's so many projects that want to implement on this area, but never success because they have to deal with like limitation of budget. And also they have to deal with many sectors that like there are some, there's so many, there, there are like um, complication between organization as well, between authority as well. For example, like mm -hmm. to agree, like whose, whose land is that? It takes really long time. And one of the problem is that because we, we have something called annual budget system in Thailand, 
So for example, the budget proposed in 2020 has to be done and has to be used by September 2021. But, you but normally when you really work on the area, it's impossible to complete everything in one year, right? And, and that's also a big um, problem as well. Okay, all right. Uh, again, I think we can accommodate a few more questions here. Um, maybe we can go to the intangible heritage uh, of Chiang Mai. Um, what does Chiang Mai do in order for to protect its intangible heritage? Uh, we have to admit that um, it's quite challenging because the world changing very fast. And when we talk about intangible cultural heritage, we talk about like um, cultural traditions in, in some way. And also some we one of the our significant intangible cultural heritage, it's called kinship, you know, the relationship between like um, people in the family. But because of the rapid change, like the relationship or connection between between a family member is not as good as what it was before. And we believe that if we cannot protect this and intangible cultural heritage, it would be hard in the future to protect even the city. Um, for example, within the old city, if this is it, if this is my ancestor house, we will have spirit house there, right? We have spirit house, and that spirit house mean like doesn't matter where you go, every new year you have to come and pay respect. But what if tomorrow? There's like a big company, big hotel company, offered that I want to buy this piece of land for like $1 million. Definitely, a lot of people sell the land and move outside. And those people destroy the ancestor house and that break the kinship system. That break a lot of like relationship, that break a lot of like intangible cultural heritage or even belief within their own family. Yeah, that's Good. just part of it, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so there was there you, you mentioned something about threats and challenges. Yes. Um, what is the biggest threat to Chiang Mai's heritage um, at, at as of this time? You mean the the heritage status or mm -hmm. um, um, it could be in general or maybe some of course the uh, um, the current challenges that you encounter. Well, I think the the the, the challenge nowadays is that. Mm -hmm. Because Chiang Mai itself have been relying on tourism business for more than 30 years. Oh. And when the COVID hit, it mm -hmm. turned out that the OCD become empty. So okay. it means that people who used to live here before were basically main investor from outside. Mm -hmm. And now the city cannot generate much income anymore. Mm -hmm. All the hotels is closed. And then that's why we have to rethink about like, once we relieve from COVID, what we could do. And I think we should use this time as an opportunity to make change. You know, we want like a walkable city. We want the city to become more like for a local people. Anyone can do business, not just like when you have a lot of money and come and invest a lot of money here. And then when the problem comes, you just go away and leave the city like empty. Yeah, that, that's a big challenge. Are there programs now that are um, um, being implemented in order to, to deal with the, the, the problems or the challenges brought about by the, by the pandemic? Well, I have to say that there is not yet a complete program about it because any change that we want to make, we have to work directly with the government, you know? And, um, okay. Let, let's come, let's talk about learning city, for example. The program we are working now, uh, me and my team working now is implementing the UNESCO learning city process into the area, but definitely is in terms of economic, gener um, econo economic it, it might be not that effective, but at least we're using this program or using these um, tools to like um, to analyze the city, and then also like we we used uh, the the program from from like a UNESCO um, learning city to improve or 
or to develop like a green space for people. And if you think in terms of physical, but um, now in tourism business, they, they're going to implement a sandbox program into the city that to attract like tourists to come back to Chiang Mai, but in, in the safer way, you know? So that would be two existing programs that's still running in, in, in the city in a big picture, but for small picture, mm -hmm. obviously like a lot of civil society, they're working on the issue, like Chiang Mai Trust, they're working on like supporting poor people or like helping those who lost their job by um, give, giving them free food or like helping them connect with like those who want to employ some like small job, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that just small programs. Okay. Um, maybe let's go back to the to local traditions. Um, how do we protect local traditions from modernization and globalization? That's a big challenge. I think nowadays mm -hmm. everyone facing everyone in the world facing the same thing. Like we want to be more of like global citizens, right? And right. Mm -hmm. we try to like um, I mean, in the Chiang Mai, in Thailand itself, we try to like implement many Western education into the system, which is good. But yeah. uh, sometimes when students don't have like a very good foundation of their own neighborhood understanding, for example, I said like, I still speak dialect because that started from my family. But a lot of my friends don't don't speak dialect at all. They speak like middle Thai or general Thai. So it means that from their gener generation, their understanding about local heritage or Lana culture would be disappear. Okay. And that's become a big threat. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of that, let's go back to the people constitution. Um, that constitution also allow local education authority to implement local knowledge into part of their curriculum as well. And that's part of the tool. So there were so many attempts in 1996 until now that to let the student learning more about their own heritage and their own culture, but still not really effective, you know, because you have to understand many schools are just completely international school or many schools are just using like curriculum from like central government. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's true. Okay. Um, let's discuss um, the protection of built heritage this time. Um, uh, how do we strike a balance between uh, government regulation and uh, private property rights? Because it's also the same problem here in Manila um, in the protection of built heritage, not just in Manila, but um, in the surrounding cities and um, provinces as well. Yeah, this is, I think I had talked with many people about that before. Mm -hmm. The point is that we, we don't have right to reinforce the property owner. Don't sell it, don't sell it. Who are you to tell them to stop selling like a land worth $1 million, right? Right. Mm -hmm. the, 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 point, the point is that, I mean, this is a big chance that for me, it's still a little bit, impossible to force the, the, the landowner. But what we've been doing is that we try to show them the value of their own property or their own heritage. Okay, you probably think it's worth 1 million now, but if you sell it and then that's it, your, your student wouldn't get anything. But if you protect this in the near future, in the next future, you can generate more value in terms of like for the city, for other people and even for your own children. I mean, it, like I say, like the government wouldn't be able to just like reinforce or just like force them to stay there. But we try to protect in different ways, just like municipal ordinance. We just try to like to protect the area that um, have the heritage value or even control the new building that come into the area, especially in the old city that all you have to be born is don't build anything that too exotic or like look like not, going well with environment to make other mm. people feel like they're part of it you know just don't don't really make like a huge difference within the mm. neighborhood area mm -hmm. I, I think the challenge i think it's not just here it happened everywhere around the world when you talk about ownership right that's true um <laughs> are they receptive um do how do they react when you when you try to convince them to 
to well, protect their their built heritage or to to make them understand um, the I, value of their property. Definitely, there are definitely definitely like two reaction. First mm -hmm. one is that they don't care. This is their land, so we cannot do anything more than that. But we control the new building that coming to the area. That okay, you have to do this. And the yeah. other thing is that, as I said before, Chiang Mai people they already have like a the highly citizenship. So we kind of like rely on this a little bit that they are like have a very strong sense of citizenship, especially especially old people. So sometimes we just like we connect to the old people, to their like grandparents instead, talking about that. And then they talk within the family that, oh, we should protect this heritage. You know, I mean, that's that's so far we can do because at the end of the day, we cannot force them to just stay there or not selling anything. And also we've been talking about the incentive, like, whoa, what about uh, those who protect their old house that older than 50 years, they don't have to pay, they, they should pay less tax for their property and something like that. So, but then again, when you talk with the, the authorities, it's like, oh, it's really difficult to go through the structure. It's hard for the regulation, this and that. So we're basically working on it at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, maybe a few more questions here. Um, maybe we can go um, delve into the, the community itself. Um, in Intramuros, we, we have a community uh, in, in different um, sectors. Um, for example, we have the informal settlers community um, wherein um, they, they occupy a land that is um, not theirs uh, and there are programs in place. Uh, for their relocation or not just relocation but maybe um, current progress in order to, to address their needs. Um, in Chiang Mai, how would you describe the, the relationship uh, of the, uh, I'm not sure if this is politically, but the poor members of the local community um, with the civil mm -hmm. society? Uh, mm -hmm. How is the relationship? Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example of Macaque now this being a problem because there's every problem within one area. Mm -hmm. um, along Mecca Canal, right, there are like poor people who live along there that they don't own the land. And the military something, I don't know, section or whatever, want to relocate these people. But these people, they don't want to move out because it's, it doesn't matter if it looks bad, it's my house. That's what they say. They were trying to relocate into like a more beautiful building or more beautiful area but these people don't want to so that's when the time that civil society come in to work as a mediator right so the way they work as a mediator is that they do survey of the of the like poor people or local community around there and just show the military section that this is what really happening this is the old ecosystem that happened here and they do some suggestion or guideline. How do we work with these people? Some of them should be here, some of them should move, but to where and how? You know, that, that's, but I didn't really know the detail of, of much. What I know so far is that there is a big mega project from the central government that mm -hmm. claim that they want to relocate poor people from the canal. But okay. poor people from the canal, they don't want to move into a flat. You know, mm -hmm. and that's why civil society become like acting against that and try to slow the process and try to like negotiate between these two uh, parties. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, maybe I, I can also bring up the, the issue of gentrification mm -hmm. uh, in, in heritage. Um, is there also the, the same um, issue or concern with Chiang Mai? Um, because um, we, we have to admit that in the in the Philippines there are members of the heritage groups belong to the middle and upper middle class and somehow there is a disconnect in, mm -hmm. in terms of how did this heritage group understand um, the, the circumstance of mm -hmm. a community um, mm -hmm. how do you address those those concerns okay we did a survey back in 2016 when we started the uh, Chiang Mai Heritage Initiative, it's turned out that not even half of the population in the OCD really original people. So it's mean that more than 50%, they have, they're just 
gentrification happen in the OCD. And the, the point is that uh, this creates such a challenge if you want to propose your area or if you want to like protect your heritage while well, half of the city is already moved out and half of it just like those who probably just work just working me uh, middle working class to upper working class some are just like upper class that still own many areas in there so we question like how can we work on it but um I didn't really catch up much about this issue because there's some complication of like issuing regulation or control. What we can do so far is to promote and campaign about the heritage value for them. Mm -hmm. But in terms of creating like incentive or like anything to attract people back or anything to protect their land, we were talking about just like, what if they, they have to be able to protect the heritage and also just be able to get income as well. So there's some idea that um, the, uh, the, con uh, the conservation team work with many creative agency of Thailand that they want to promote those who, who do creative business and protect the heritage in the city as well to become example of, to other people. That's so far what 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 we have been doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of promoting the, the heritage, um, um, there is a question here. Uh, how do you make sure that your promotion efforts uh, doesn't compete with the, um, I think that the promotional programs of Bangkok or other cities in Thailand? Do, do you think there's actually a uh, um, a competition as, uh, of sorts? I think for me personally, competition is good, you know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, um, there's so many programs that we learn from another city and also another city learn from us because um, a years ago, I went to like um, an, an old town like conference or something where like every many city around Thailand just come and talk about their program. And I think competitive in this way, I mean, not the budget, all right? <laughs> I mean, even in terms of budget, if that competition is going to make good for the city, it's fine. If you're better than me, take it. Um, I, I, I will look at into two aspects. I think competition is good in order to like make the process better. But there, you have to admit that there are some competition that's based on the budget or the state status they would get. And I think this is not okay sometimes because at the end of the day, these people or this group, some of these group only work for the state that not really their own, the, the good for the city and community. So this is the truth that happened. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, I think if you have done something bad to the area or the people, that will come back to you anyway. And I have seen that. I have seen many groups that falling apart because they didn't really do that for, for the community or like for the issue they're interested in. They only do it just for like the status or money sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so there's an attempt to, to complement each other's program or was there, is there um, that attempt to complement each other in terms of um, promoting a city or preserving a city? Um, are you, are you, um, I, I the question is, are, are you both um, in line with each other's um, advocacies? Uh, or, yeah? Mm -hmm. I think we, we are, but okay. I, I can say that we are aligned and we can work together, but mm -hmm. it's just like you have friends. You need to understand the character of each of your friends, mm -hmm. right? Because it, each of your friend or each of like, the civil society or civil group or activists, whatever you can call them, they have their own idea with some time that's better than you, right? So if you look in the big picture, we are aligned, but we just like antibody, you know? We, when there's something bad come into our body, we split our work and then uh, attack different issue. And that mm -hmm. is the ecosystem that happened here. You know, we, we cannot generalize, we cannot generalize everyone 
to work mm -hmm. in the same way. I think that's kind of against the nature structure of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, give the last two questions yes, um, sure. before we end. <laughs> okay. Um, in terms of consultation, should there be a distinction between expert NGOs versus non-expert NGOs in the pursuit towards consensus? Should the opinion of expert groups be given greater priority? The point is that a lot of expert a lot of expertise now there were in GO before. There's some like you you have to understand there's some like evolution of these group of people, right? So um, I would answer that it depends on the subject or the situation at that moment. What kind of weight we should put on it? For example, if these really affect directly to community people, um, mm -hmm. we we can just uh, bring civil society who work with this community and some mm -hmm. expertise or some academic to work with it. And there's some issue like a bigger issue, just for example, like um, a very big structure or a very big uh, development project. We rely on academics or those who are expertise in that issue to have like louder voice. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's sometimes it's quite hard to divide everything equally. You just have to like design or like plan everything or you need somebody who just like to understand that this situation like who should be the first one who should be the first speaker who should be like the supporter mm -hmm. and that is something we i have to say we cannot design but uh we 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 know each other enough to just like make a call just like okay this happened you go first and then i'll go next and then we bring mm -hmm. these people in this connection as i say like i showed the map of network there are 40 40 group right it's turned out mm -hmm. that we all know each other through somebody or through mm -hmm. some kind of works. And that's the ecosystem of how, how we work. But I think it's, it's, it's a really good idea if we kind of have um, directory of civil society, like, oh, if there's issue about environment, these are the list of civil society that should get involved. And, and I think that's something we, we want, we, we working on it as well. Because mm -hmm. we plan to propose this to local councils, just like, okay, it's like a handbook for you. If you don't know who, who to contact, just like open this guideline and then you'll be okay. Yeah, because nowadays when there's problem happen, it's usually based on personal connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, was there ever a time that, um, you know, the, the, the civil society was professionalized? I mean, um, what I mean is, um, uh, they become part of the government or it becomes a money-making career. Mm -hmm. um, are you open to it or is, is there any group in Chiang Mai that is, has attempted or been open to, to that kind of uh, civil society work to professionalize it instead of um, having an informal group dialoguing with other mm -hmm. communities? Um, usually, usually we are like architect, urban planner. Mm -hmm. mostly on academic side there's there are a lot of historian as well there are a lot of like even um artists musicians so if you want to group thing based on their professionalism or pe uh, professional career yeah most of most of us are like architect urban planner uh like uh, those who work for in in preservation uh, because as I said before, like everything that happened into the city is always like going back to the relationship between the urban planning value and stuff. And also we have, um, I think one of the main person that work that she, she is very powerful. Her background is art <laughs> and that's her professional. So that's why she can create like a very beautiful like event and also a student can learn at the same time. I think when you talk about professionalism or like what kind of professional group is mm -hmm. just around this area, just architecture, urban planning, um, those who work in conservation, environmental person, musician, and artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so there, there's a, a variety of, uh, yeah, of very, different very, sectors. Okay. Yes. But I, I think uh, we can accommodate one last question. Um, What's your vision for Chiang Mai, all things considered, um, especially now? Do you have a vision or well, 
the vision now is that, I mean, it's actually related to the work we are working at the moment. We're making a sustainable plan for civil society in order to like protect the, the city. Um, my only vision here is that we hope that in the next five or 10 years, people will start to recognize their own value more. It doesn't sound like anything fancy, but if you really stay here is that we have everything. We have people, we have resources, we have culture, we have tradition, but we, what we have been neglect, like forget about this thing for a long time. We want to modernize ourselves. And it's not easy at all in the next five or 10 years to make people really recognize their true value. You know, like that's that, that part of the vision. And also is that part of the thing, especially on the civil society, uh, we have a vision that in the next five or 10 years, this civil society will become more, um, become more official in some way. Because you mm -hmm. have to, I have to admit that, uh, we have to admit that a lot of them never register themselves as an official body. And they, that's why they sometimes have problem with getting budget from central government because they have a rule that you have to be like a registered body or register organization, whatever, then you can get funding from central government. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy either because they're really individual. They probably just like don't want to register at all. So yeah. And yeah, we hope that we want to create more collaborative process with local government more than what we have now okay. in five or 10 years. Yep. Mm, thank you for that. And thank you so much for answering so many questions <laughs> from our end. Um, we still have a number of questions here in the chat box. Uh, I'm afraid we won't be able to answer this anymore, but um, perhaps our dear speaker would like to send or maybe give yeah. her email address so oh, that sure. maybe you can uh, put it on the chat box for those who would like to, sure, to sure. answer um, if you want to answer the questions or for those who would like to send in more questions. All yeah, right? sure. Yes, okay. sure. So there, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. so um, let me share my screen first before for some reminders before we end the, um, the, the lecture this afternoon. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for attending the uh, the interim news learning sessions this afternoon. Um, if you have, uh, if you missed the, the session, uh, we will um, have it uploaded on our YouTube channel on the interim news administration. But please don't forget to like and subscribe to our social media accounts. This would help us a lot um, in terms of uh, communicating with you. And in relation to our topic this afternoon, um, more of a dialogue on how to improve the community of Intramuros. So please like uh, official Intramuros administration, Twitter and Intramuros, Instagram Intramuros PH. We have a number of online programs. Please support and like and uh, comment on, on our social media pages. So there, if you missed our session this afternoon, if you just logged in, if you just registered, um, um, late, um, please feel free to, to type in bit.ly slash IAILS on YouTube and we will, uh, you'll be able to watch the, um, uh, the lecture um, this afternoon. Okay, so um, Miss um, Ajirata. Call me fan, fan, fan. Fan, okay. <laughs> That's so my fan. name. All right, so, so fan, any last words? Um, well, before we end? yeah. I mean, like, thank you for like everyone who come here to listen to my lecture. I I know sometimes it's really difficult to explain in terms of like really represent civil society or like Chiang Mai itself. But I mean, obviously there's so many cases, there's so many things that I have learned from the Philippines, you know. I mean, I also know that the heritage the conservation there is really in good quality. And there's so many things that we could learn from you. And we hope in the future that I can have like, uh, I can use this connection to like okay. maybe share some idea or even invite you to join our session sometime. So thank you so much for having me and thank you for all like all the questions and if you have any other questions just send me on email. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thank you very much Fan. In fact, we, we would really like to connect with other uh, groups such as yours, um, especially in Chiang Mai. I, 
uh, on a personal note, we I, I like what you said when uh, you mentioned the ability to use existing resources mm -hmm. in terms yes. of creativity. So it's not just art and culture, but what ha what the community has at that um, on hand or at, yes. at uh, uh, given given the circumstances. That's a very good um, input. Thank you very much for that, Fan. Thank right. you. So, so this ends our learning session on this afternoon, episode 67. Again, thank you very much to those who attended, the, the tour guides, the students, the teachers. We're very, very pleased uh, that you're supporting the, the, uh, the ILS since last year. And thank you again, Ms. Fan, for, for your support. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah.